I would have loved to have seen her dance. I guess there are no films of her, but of course there are these photographs. There's one of her where she's in a white leotard with a white skull cap. Her lean, long, elegant body. It's it's not the body of the of the old ballerinas in Russia, say the 1910 ballerinas. She's just amazing. I've never seen anybody like that. I'd seen people that were good technicians, but I really thought this is very chic, very elegant, and this is what I would like to look like, you know, and I had never seen anybody I really wanted to look like. So to see Dubrovska looking so modern was indeed a, you know, terrific shock. She was really the most elegant, the most extraordinary, refined person I've ever seen, and just wonderful, wonderful style, and incredible legs and feet. I mean, she just would embarrass all the young girls because she was so much more supple, her body was so much more effective. That's something I would say to most dancers and teachers are very crucial and very important and the ones that you choose to go to, really, you do, you take on their essence, you, you absorb it. Concert, and Jerry took the rehearsal. I, I guess I learned the steps just by watching Tanny or basically had an idea of the steps. Uh, Jerry said to me, think of Dabraska making her entrance in, into the classroom, you know, that sort of slightly nervous, beautiful uh, floating entrance that she makes when she's going to teach class and she's very elegant and very long and she just makes an entrance. So. That's what I thought of, and it was a great help. Well, I knew uh, Madame Dubrovska when, as you know, she was married to Mr. Vladimirov, who was one of the original teachers at the School of American Ballet. So when I was 17 years old and first came to New York, I, of course, immediately went to the School of American Ballet. And um, uh, Vladimirov was teaching. And once in a while, Madame Dubrovska would come to watch class. So after, and she was very shy, by the way. Madame Dubrovska was very, very shy. I mean, for this beautiful, elegant woman with these. Anyway, at, at one point, we had seen them socially, Balanchine and I. And finally, I said to George, I wonder if she would be willing to come and teach. I know she's very shy. So he asked her, and she said yes. And she came, and... Uh, you asked me if I had seen her dance. I almost feel as if I have seen her dance because in class, the way she would demonstrate and the elegance of her port de bras and her beautiful feet, these interminable legs that went on and on and this beautiful, elegant line that she portrayed. So this was a great inspiration to all of us. I'd never seen a teacher get up on toe. And Dubrovska came with those legs and those feet and taught toe. And it was what Balanchine always asked for. I remember she cheated à la seconde, développé à la seconde. She wore, I don't think she wore toe shoes, I think she wore ballet shoes. And she had one of those dresses on and she did développé à la seconde and it went up to her ear. It was a thin, thin leg, looked like no muscles couldn't figure out what held it up, and the most beautiful foot on the end. She was uh, extremely concerned about uh, line. The positions 
well, it had to be correct, of course, but th that was the least of it. You had to really extend and uh, overextend your line very much. And of course, that's, what I think, what Mr. Valentine particularly admired about her. But she was a truly great teacher. And uh, it's hard to be a great teacher because you, you have to continually give every day. And it's not a performance. You're not getting applause. It's a different kind of applause. If you can see results in a student, you can see improvement and uh, desire and change and excitement. These days, I like to compare the two future generation to the past. Uh, often, always, you only see them going around criticizing, or it's as if you know there's some you know meat hanging up on the the, the bars. Um, and there was a wonderful appreciation of the old ways and the old teachers that they would they would take what they saw, whatever it was. It didn't matter whether it was a little speck or a spark of the divine there. They took it and they were going to make something out of you. And of course, if you had something more, there was this incredible love, love for that talent. And that, that was the most incredible thing when I was growing up, at, going through that school, I'd say, that meant more to me that I was in the presence of greatness. I once, when I was teaching up in a dance theater of Harlem, I took one of his steps and I mentioned, you know, and gave it to the kids. And I mentioned, I said, oh, I took that step of yours. And she said, oh, no, no, no. It's not my step. It's not my step at all. It is my teacher's step. So I thought, well, that's kind of nice that she taught a step that her teacher had taught her, and then I went up and taught it. This was a woman who was part of ballet history. In the combinations, I suddenly felt that this, this was a part of history. These steps and the combinations went back to old Russia, and they were beautiful in their construction, in their musicality, and in their imaginativeness. Part of the past to which Madame de Brusca provided the link for her American students was her own training in the Imperial Russian Ballet School in pre-revolutionary St. Petersburg. She was born in 1896, and when she was 10, she entered the Imperial School. There she spent the next seven years mastering the technique and the stylistic heritage of the Russian ballet. Madame Yuzhinska, I remember still in school. She was one year in the school. I was uh, just, I came to school and she finished school. And she used to teach me in the evening. Uh, old uh, students, they teach little uh, young girls. They ask what you didn't understand during the class. And um, uh, that's 15 minutes. I remember very well. After graduating from the Imperial Ballet School, Dubrovska became a member of the Court of Ballet and then a soloist in the ballet of the Marinsky Theater. Three years after the revolution, she left Russia, escaping on skis over the border to Finland with a group of people that included her mother and her future husband, Pierre Vladimirov, a principal dancer of the Marinsky. Vladimirov almost immediately went to work with Pavlova and became her partner and a principal dancer with her. Fokin used to talk about Vladimirov as well because he thought he was really a greater dancer than Nizhinsky. And uh, uh, Dubrovsky as well worked with Pavlova for a while and danced with her. 
My first performance was Symphony in C in the Chord Ballet, second movement, which is where many people start. And I didn't know how to do any of it. And, and afterwards, Dabrowska and Maria Stewart came backstage, which was very nice. So Mr. B had alerted them, and they, they came. And they both gave me a bouquet. But Dabrowska's was a nosegay of violets with a pink rose in the middle, which was a wonderful combination. It was very beautiful and arresting. And I said, oh, it's just beautiful. And she said that Pavlova had given her a bouquet just like that. That was just a wonderful moment, because I knew that that sort of linked me with her past in a way. So I was very thrilled. Oh, she told me a wonderful story. She was supposed to dance Giselle at the Paris Opera with Pavlova as Giselle and Madame Dubrovska as the Queen of the Willies. So she was in her dressing room, and suddenly the dresser arrives and says, Madame Pavlova says, you wear this. And <laughs> picked, showed this huge, long dress covering her feet completely. <laughs> And a wig with pigtails. <laughs> now, if you've ever seen Giselle and seen the Queen of the Willies, I mean, she comes, she's an imperious figure. So Madame de Ross could look at that and, and, needless to say, did not appear in that on the stage. She wore exactly what she had intended to wear. Well, it was very shortly after that that uh, Diego had produced Sleeping Beauty in London. And uh, hired both Vladimirov and Dubrovska for Sleeping Beauty. And that's where they were married, during the Sleeping Beauty season in London. As a matter of fact, there were, there were wonderful newspaper clippings about the fairy, uh, the fairy marrying the prince, which was rather sweet, and all sorts of pictures in the newspapers. Jagger's choreographers created many important roles for Dubrovska, including leading roles in Apollo and Prodigal Son by Balanchine. The first role created for her was that of the bride in Nijinska's innovative ballet Les Nos. And I don't know, remember what she does first, but then uh, a few months later she did uh, Les Nos, the Stravinsky. And that was very difficult for us, the music, uh, uh, the Stravinsky. Because we have, in, in Russia, we didn't know never the Stravinsky. Uh, that's, especially the nose was very difficult. We have been not able to dance to come there, because it's one, two, three, one, two, one. Three, three. Then there was some song in the uh, book, and we danced to, by this song. We learned this. Chisu, Pachisu, Nastasi, Naka. And like this, we uh, learned the steps. It was, I didn't do that much dance. Mostly the corda ballet around me, they danced with my long, long hair. Well, Nijinska, when he, she did Bish, it was very hard. This ballet, she was, she was very, Mm, demanding to do exactly what she wants to do. It was a little different arabesque, for instance. We used to do arabesque this way, and she did a little like this arabesque. Dun, 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 this position. And then we have to jump in the sofa. One, we run, and to jump, then again, around. And at the end, we, a few times, we do, did the step, and we, Having, and she just keep going, you are tired, but I'm not tired. Keep going. And we have to, that was, she was very demanding during the uh, rehearsals, and very difficult. But uh, uh, in the life, she was charming. Then she stopped to dance this um, hostess, uh, Jagger gave me to dance. Seems uh, Sokolova did before, between. And then uh, Sokolova, and then I, I, I did. And I was very proud. I, I like this. But, uh, that's you know. I, I I was with pearls, with uh, jewelry, and I attract the men. And then once Diego said, you know, mm, you do very not bad. He never said, well, it is not bad what you do. But you know, I don't like the dress. You have same dress as all uh, girls around. And I would like you go to uh, Chanel, Madame Chanel, 
a choosing dress uh, because it was 20 uh, set, you know, when the uh, dress was very short and the waist was here. So, uh, you could dance, I mean, on this dress. And I went to Chanel, I chose a dress. It was uh, this, this dress which I danced. It was, then I feel as queen. In 1928, Valentin created his ballet Apollo in which Dubrovska originated the role of the muse Polyhymnia. In later years, one of Dubrovska's successors as Polyhymnia was Tanaki Leclerc. I did Polyhymnia when George did it uh, at City Center, and she came and showed a few things. One thing I remember she said at the very end, she couldn't remember if she did a double pirouette or a triple, yeah, I've got a triple. She's not going to tell me she knocked off a triple, is she? Then she settled for a double. So that was all fun. I, I was a muse of scenes. Uh, all variation, I danced with one finger on my uh, face. Uh, at the end, suddenly, I do two pirouettes. I said, huh? I forget I have to. And then I remember, I, and I did too much. Too, uh, with too much emotion. And immediately after the performance, Maurice Kochano came. He said, Mr. Tiger, I want to talk. Uh, everything uh, I did well, my pirouette was good, I, I didn't do any mistakes. I, I think, well, yeah, all right. I was completely conf confident. But and suddenly he came, he said, Dubrovska, you see, uh, it's very serious theater here. It's not a music hall, and you know I don't want you to do so much um, emotion show. What is it? Was so much emotion? Uh, it was ridiculous. And please don't do any more. Then second time I just up, up. The role for which Dubrovska is probably best remembered was in Balanchine's 1929 ballet *Prodigal Son*, in which she originated the role of the siren. Mr. Valentin used her in an extraordinary way, and that was uh, really very unusual for that period in the history of ballet. The prodigal, you know, if you were really to key in on that role in her, you would see a lot of what one can do. That was class. That was eroticism and class is all rolled into one little nifty package, you know. You didn't have to do one or the other. Her identity was secure and strong, and no matter what she did, there she was, and she stood there as a beacon. This was the other part of the past to which Dubrovska linked her students, the early, heady days of their own modernist, neoclassical heritage. I remember uh, when they said we will do the prodigal son. For me, a little strange this uh, uh, this ballet. Uh, what Parentin wants from me, some move, movements uh, seems to be for me not so even maybe handsome, pretty. I mean, uh, this was a little. You ha later on, I understood. You have to understand this uh, role and the steps. But first moment when he showed something like this, I thought, oh my goodness, this seems to be is not so attractive. Uh, who gave me clue how to approach this role? Because I, th I thought, oh, you have to seduce them. As you seduce them sometimes in their life, some smile, some uh, eye, some <laughs> other eye. But uh, the other said, no, it's not this way. You have to think about it. Is you are something very uh, dramatic, uh, seduces, and you have to do different. And he gave me a clue. He said, "Think about the snake, how he hypnotizes the poor animal, and he hypnotizes. They are not able to move. They are completely crazy." And that's uh, I understood suddenly, and I didn't uh, laugh. I didn't smile, but just the uh, uh, all. Thing, or mostly was the movement of my body, the epaulement, and then I. I have a make, very nice makeup, that gave uh, much impression. I used to like very much to dance this one. It was not difficult. And I remember Paris was um, half for the ballet, 
half they said it's normal and there's something awful. That was a very great discussion about that. If you start a variation, a, a regular variation, uh, you start, you come on the stage, you start like this, or like this, you see, and then you start your correct steps which you learn in uh, cl uh, class. But here in uh, uh, practical sound, suddenly you come on the knee, you come on the knee, like this, you cover yourself with that, then he pick up your, and you come back completely, back, 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 back. And then you start to dance differently. You, uh, he do, you stay, that was Valentin first, this is clue of his dance. Do you even, uh, notice that he always has this position? Always. And then it was in the practical side. When he come under the, uh, her legs, and he pick up her and her uh, shoulders, and then he change her uh, You know, that is, uh, was not classical. There's many things there is different, but still you are on top, of course you do pirouettes on the dawn, the war, that you do that. But at the same time, it's, uh, no, if you are a dancer, you can see that it's not classical. But Madame Dubrovska made this link with the Russian and European past very real, very alive for her students, not only in the classroom, but in daily life and in the stories she told. The Angelian will have all respect for him, a great respect, but still he was a director. And uh, once he came to uh, our apartment house in Monte Carlo for lunch, I invited him, it was a great honor, he accepted. And my husband was with Pavlova in um, Egypt, and uh, it was my mother, I. He came with uh, Boris Kochno, Lifa, and uh, I seduced him, I suppose. I said, Valentin will prepare the uh, dinner, lunch. That was lunch, not dinner. And he said, oh, Valentin, I heard he cooks very well. I said, Yes, Mr. Stupid, he will do for you special. That's, maybe that's why he accepted, I don't know. And he came. It, first, what it was, it's tomato, big tomato farsi. That's I, as yesterday, I remember. That served, made service for tomato farsi. And he started to eat. It was very delicious. Why he put inside Valentina, I don't know. But it was delicious. And uh, then uh, Jagriff, uh, try, he said, yes, it's so good, it's not bad. But he asked my mom, but you are sure he, he, uh, Valentin doesn't want to poison me? He said, he likes to joke. When Diaghilev died in 1929, his company disbanded. He supposed next year to go to America. He died just, he signed already a contract to go to America. We had been so happy. Even when uh, Vladimirov came to the School of American Ballet, originally to, to New York, Madame Dubrovska stayed behind in Paris, and she only joined him eventually. Dubrovska did not perform all that much once she arrived in America. She did dance for Balanchine with the American Ballet in Hartford, and did guest performances with Jibazel's Ballet Russe and with the Metropolitan Opera Ballet. But she retired from the stage in 1939, at the age of 43, very few Americans ever saw her dance. And it was another 10 years after that before she began teaching. She was not a screamer. She was very nice. She corrected very quietly. I think she was very nice about people's feelings. I think she was more the kind that would call you over in the corner after class was finished and tell you what was the matter instead of just being, you know doing being mean and saying in front of people. She was a very gentle woman. She was very, but you had a feeling she was well brought up, that she didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings.
I just, uh, I just love the way she constructed her class and how much she gave and her eye. She used to say she had, um, she had eyes in the back of her head. Because, so she said, I see everything because I have eyes in the back of my head. Well, of course, the mirror helped. And she used to come for Russian Easter, and she brought Spasitsa down. I think it was two Easters, two Russian Easters. And that was amazing to see Spasitsa with it. I had always thought Spasitsa was tall, like Dubrovska, and this tiny, tiny, tiny lady came in. There's another thing about Dubrovska. She was very un-egotistical. She would always say, Ah, oh, but Spasitsova, she was the one. I was in class with that, but Spasitsova. And she was always very um, self-effacing. She was very, a very modest person, which I like. You have some steps? No, I'm just saying. No, I'm just saying. That is not mine. That's Mr. Valentin's steps. That is will be like that. One seems to be over there. But one, two. She cared so much, and that's why she was a little shy and a little nervous. So it was actually actually made her a better teacher because she cared so much. And we spent a lot of times talking about her feelings about what had happened in her career and how she wasn't recognized as much as much as she could have been. And uh, lots of stories about Danilova, which we won't go into, but um, there's sort of competition with, within themselves and to each other. And that was a lot of fun to see and to hear about. I think Danilova and she were great rivals in a way, but also friendly. It, uh, I always think of Rommel and uh, Field Marshal Montgomery. Field Marshal Montgomery kept uh, a photograph of Rommel in his tent, but it's, it's not quite that. But, uh, I mean, they weren't both generals, but they were both ballerinas. In 1975, Madame Danilova had been asked to stage the male variation from Pavillon d'Armide for Bereshnikov to perform at the Hamburg Festival that year. At one of her rehearsals, she asked Madame Dubrovska for her assistance in reconstructing the ballet.
sort of a uh, Yes, I remember. But uh, you said that uh, Fokin would never do small things, that he had such an elevation that it shows in all the variation that he uh, yes. fly. So it shouldn't be small, uh, small things. It it, no, no, it no, shouldn't no, no, be. Should That's be. what you are pointing yes. to me. Because uh, in the Carnaval, he has very lot of small steps. Yes. The Rizé, yes. Rizé, Volé, da, 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 very yes. Much. But yes. here, that was large. Large. Yes, I remember that uh, even Mr. Vladimir, uh, 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 your husband, that uh, he was f flying, you From know. Everything was flying, moving. Enormous And always moving. Well, I think as far as uh, I, I thank you very much for helping me, but we did already practically. Yes. Uh, you know, I am sorry it will I didn't come. help enough. Oh, I no, but I, 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 no, you must, uh, yes, we must I, do it tomorrow. Thank you very something. much. The, Mr. Vladimirov showered her with presents all the time and uh, gave her uh, all sorts of jewels. And, and one of them was a rather beautiful diamond ring that uh, when she went to make her will, she uh, said that she was going to leave to the school. And uh, she thought it was worth something like $5,000. Uh, I said, well, you know, $5,000 to the school and its budget is like a drop in the bucket. It will mean nothing at all. I think what is missing from the school and is missing from most of the dance world, as a matter of fact, is a fund that does take care of aging teachers or ailing teachers, or even students, dancers, former dancers who uh, pass through the school. And I thought, I said, why don't you create, a start? let's start a fund with your $5,000, which we will call the Dubrovska. And she said, immediately said, Dubrovska Vladimirov Fund. And uh, so uh, that, when she did die, we had the uh, diamond sold and it was $50,000. And it's, it's been very, very useful. And well, I'm very happy to say that uh, uh, she's still remembered very much because of that, because of that marvelous uh, gesture that she made. I had a call came around five o'clock or so to say that Dubrovska had passed away in the store and there was gonna be a funeral service. And it was the standard, the Russian funeral service, a beautiful, beautiful place. And um, George was in front of me, Mr. B was in front of me. And he sort of turned around and in a very adroit manner to let, to acknowledge my presence and that I knew what was going on, you see, because to him, it said something to him. It said I was awake. It said, she knows something is going on here because see, no one thinks this is important. Dubrovska, not very important. Filia's Dubrovska's funeral service, but there are a few and I see who, and I'm gonna say something. And he turned around and he said, you see, dear, this is the end of an era.